Hello, everyone. This is Michaela, and you're listening to the End All the Things podcast. As a life coach and facilitator, I work with individuals and groups to empower their best selves to shine to the betterment of all involved. My goal is always to bring you closer to trusting the voice inside of you that is authentically yours. My job here is no different. In my journey through life, I continue to meet people who use their authenticity, their gifts, to grow, change, and serve through professional and personal endeavors. These people and their stories become my gift to you, for I cannot keep a good thing to myself, and I believe that they may inspire a part of your story to evolve. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to And All The Things. I have a really interesting conversation for you today. We are talking about intuitive eating with certified intuitive eating counselor, Limor Elman. Together, we go way beyond talking about food and what we eat and when we eat, but more importantly, how we think about food and how we think about our bodies. She and I will break through a lot of stigmas from societal impact to weight and diet culture. We get into how do you define health? What does healthy mean for you? We even touch on racism and all the ways we can bring self-compassion into our behaviors to live a more joyful life. And you know, that's right up my alley. So without further ado, I offer you Limor Elman and all the things. All right, friends, this is going to be a lot of fun, and we are going to start going right into it with my guest, Limor Elman. And I'm I'm really excited to start here because, as with all my guests, we are going to explore all the things, and you really bring so much to the table. So when I asked you in a preform. Um, if you had a magic wand, what would you change today? And your response was amazing. You said, remove stigma from our world. Can you tell me what that means to you and why that would be the most important thing you could do? Yeah. So in its essence, stigma is discrimination. And discrimination places a hierarchy of value on human beings. And I have a feeling that on an intellectual level, most human beings don't like the idea that there could be one better human versus another better human Mm -hmm. or versus a worse human. And so, but, but the problem is that stigma is so embedded in our culture Mm-hmm. It's such a part of who we are that it goes without noticing. And a large reason is confirmation bias. Mm-hmm. What are so, some com- of those that you see? If I could just jump in, like what are some of the small, whether it's specific to your experience here on earth or what you see in the experience of others? Yeah. So what I, uh, work on in my coaching practice is weight stigma. Mm -hmm. And this manifests as, I I mean, it is, it is embedded within diet culture and I can define Mm -hmm. diet culture soon. Uh, The way I see it is in, I'll give you a, a great example. I opened my front door. I live on a suburban street and, you know, there are houses right nearby and I've lived here for 20 years. And Mm -hmm. in Maplewood, New Jersey, I opened my door, walked about three or four houses down the street and a neighbor was standing there with her dog and another neighbor came by and the neighbor with her dog said to the other neighbor, wow, it looks like you lost weight. (laughs) And the other neighbor said, oh, thanks. I didn't really, but but I've been going to the gym. Thanks a lot. And so it occurred to me that commentary on body, I can just experience by walking out my door and being in the world in three minutes. Mm 
Mm -hmm. So weight stigma is the notion that people who are in a higher weight are inherently bad, mm -hmm. are inferior, are um, not lack willpower, mm -hmm. lack discipline, um, don't have their values right, are unhealthy. And we actually have plenty of research that weight stigma contributes to poor health much more than weight itself. Hmm. So the emotional mental toll and the choices we make based on that is more detrimental to our overall well-being than being quote obese or outside of whatever body metrics measure. Okay. Right. And why is that? Why do you see, how do you see that living out in, in us as women, as in our children? Yeah. So it all comes from patriarchy. Mm -hmm. uh, it's only about, I mean, dieting only became popular in like the late 1800s or mid to late 1800s. So it's actually a relatively new phenomenon. What um, going on? Do you what? Know? Like, what was the cultural or uh, industrial change that brought that I on? I don't exactly remember, but a more buxom woman was seen as a woman who was more desirable in like the 1850s. Right. Um, I think that, and racism, weight stigma has its roots in racism, actually, as well. Interesting. Yeah. So there's a fantastic book that I highly recommend um, called Fearing the Black Body by Sabrina Strings and wow. another one called My Body is Not an Apology uh, by Sonia Re Renee Taylor. Sonia wow. Renee Taylor. That, that title mm -hmm. in and of itself just like yeah. made my heart skip a beat. Yeah. My Body is Not an Apology. Mm -hmm. Oh. Yeah. And those are two beautiful books that talk about the origins of weight discrimination, essentially in racism. Interesting. So can you, can you point to one example of how that might be so that, cause like, like, wow, was it about the servants or yeah. as, as you know, blacks and whites were having more yes. children together? Like, was there, what's yeah. the crux of that? That's exactly what you just described. You know, as colonialism took hold in this country, um, white people were becoming more affluent than black people, right? Mm -hmm. And so, and a black person's natural body is slightly larger than a white person's. And so there you go. That's so then to fit in, it became, right? Like as... Now, as laws are changing, systems are changing, and and blacks and whites are living cohabitating, or maybe not cohabitating, but sharing space in the world. Now to fit in, now I need to be thinner, skinnier, um, to look like, more yes. like the, oh, okay. Thank you. That is really <laughs> interesting. Um, and I have to think that I, I believe and I know that also, as we go through into the industrial revolution and we're, we're canning foods and we're packaging things that now there's marketing behind it, right? Yes. And we start to see this is what you should eat. And this is what the ideal woman looks like. And, you know, the women vacuuming in their high heels and, and you know, hair all done, which right. I tried that once. It's really hard I just <laughs> to see if like what the hype was. And it's not that easy, right? Because you're like, <laughs> um, so we're here to debunk all of that. Okay. We're, we're going to do that. <laughs> so, so let's go back to stigma. So thank you for sharing all of that. We're seeing stigma in, in the weight, in the diet culture, in the perception of our self-worth based on our bodies. But one other stigma that we've talked about, and I'm going to lead into it is, can you tell me about your name and yes. how that has informed my gut says this desire to yeah. eradicate stigma beyond, yeah. not just, but beyond only weight and diet and, and health. So yes. tell me, Lee Moore. 
So yeah, my name Lee Moore is Israeli. Um, my father was raised in Israel um, and moved here in the late in 1970. And I was born here. Um, and so were my siblings. Uh, but all of his family is there. Many, many cousins and et cetera. Um, yeah, I, you know, maintain a pride in being connected to a country that represents me. Mm -hmm. I do not associate my pride with the current political uh, decision making. Mm -hmm. And, and so for our listeners, we're recording in September of 2024, a month away, almost a month away from the October 7th attacks, um, Israel, Hamas, all the chaos happening over there. And again, like we don't have to go deep politics, but but that is happening simultaneous to you living here. Mm -hmm. And we make a lot of assumptions here in America, don't we? Yes. We make a yeah. lot of assumptions that if you are, let's go there of this weight category, mm -hmm. your value, your worth, your et cetera. If you are of Israeli descent, what are the stigmas people are coming at you for today? Mm. What, do they, what do they assume about you that doesn't feel right? Yeah, I mean, I think that they assume, you know, immediate discrimination, you know, a, a mindset of discrimination, a mindset it, of- Just because she's Israeli, because she's Israeli. And that's and that's a bad thing, right? Is exactly. that what you're feeling? Okay. Exactly. Not my words, by the way, friends. Not yeah. my words at all. Yeah. Um, but yeah. that's the feeling you're receiving from American culture today. Yes. And do I you actually... think that's because of the political choices that are being made, right? Oh, so yeah. Prior to October 7th, did you feel like this? Can you share what uh... friend? No, not as much as now. I mean, you know, obviously there's been a lot of turmoil in that region of the world. And sure. you know, Israel, in my opinion, hasn't done, you know, hasn't done, made decisions that I've liked either. But this is rather dramatic. Mm -hmm. So, no, I, I really have a hard time talking about my Israeli roots. And I actually wind up not talking about it. Well, I appreciate your your <laughs> courage today to share this with me and our listeners. So thank you. And what I what I've come to realize is that we do make these determinations very easy, right? When we think about um, Pakistan and and more and Korea, right, where it's more obvious that mm. certain physical features indicate, you know, certain origins, but for, for you, being a white woman in America, I wouldn't know that you were Israeli. So does yeah. your name give it away? Ah. Or do you just kind of like skirt past that? Because <laughs> your name comes from, if I recall, a, a grandmother? No, no. There's... No, it doesn't. It's just, an, a, it was a really oh. common name when I went, common Israeli name when I was born. But it means something. It means ah, yes. breath. Uh, no, Lee means mine and more is a fragrance or an herb. It's actually M-Y-R, Myr. Uh, so it means my, my scent, my scent. Okay, so that's where I was thinking. I knew it had something to do with the nose. And when we <laughs> talked a few weeks, months ago, I said, so essentially your name is you're creating your own essence, yeah. your own sense, your own essence. And, and I think it's special that that comes from a word that now could be indicative of inviting stigma and discrimination towards you, yet it is also representative of exactly who you are, right? Mm -hmm. So I remember that conversation. I'm sorry it took me a minute to uh, totally recollect it, but what that says about me is that you're doing you in the world, even yes. though it may not be obviously easy, right? Yeah. So when you think about yourself as, let's go back in time, let's go to maybe 10 years old, right? What did you want to be when you grew up? Mm -hmm. Generally speaking, you could pick a different age. A ballerina. Oh, 
I love that. Do you still dance? I do. Fantastic. It's socially, not, right, you know. Right. <laughs> so you go out and shake your booty, not necessarily twirl on your tippy toes. Um, and when did that change? When did you decide um, to be something else? Uh, it wasn't ever something that I was allowed to pursue mm -hmm. because the cultural norm in my family and in the community in which I was raised was to pursue uh, you know, academic interests and professional mm -hmm. interests that were deemed right. Favorite. Respectable. Right. Yep. And so a dancer, you know, there's, not no, there's just no way, which was interesting because women in, you know, the, the seventies and eighties were just starting to, um, become, you know, um, business women and, and acknowledged exactly. Right. And, and it's, it just didn't seep into, um, my home, hmm. but, um, but so, that's okay. go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. I but just have a thread. Okay. To <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, um, I mean, I'm 52. I think, you know, I have figured out, I have developed a professional, um, career that is wildly satisfying, mm -hmm. um, beyond, beyond my wildest dreams. Yeah. And so, um, I don't really feel like I have been stifled mm -hmm. and I do feel like I've had a lot of privilege in order to get here. And I am very grateful for that. And, and it is important to acknowledge, but it's also coupled with your desire to serve, you know, you, you were a teacher, I think you still teach them, right? Um, and the desire to help others grow beyond wherever they are, that that's powerful. That's yes. incredibly powerful. Okay, I'm going to step back real quick and, and tug that thread. So one thing I believe I know about the dance industry, especially ballerinas, is if you want to talk about body image issues, um, it is a great place in some spaces. Some spaces are incredibly healthy, right? Or however we want to define them. But culturally, there is a prototype for yes. a ballerina. Yes. Did that, how does that inform how the rest of your story goes? Or did it not touch you at that time somehow? It it did touch me at that time. Um, you know, I never had a ballerina's body. Um, I've always lived in a larger body. Uh, thanks to dieting, I became larger and larger and larger. Interesting. Sure. Counterintuitive. And we can talk about that in a minute. Sure. So yes, um, I, you know, not only that cultural messaging that I heard from my family and my community that, you know, that professional pursuit was not deemed as something respectable, but it was also like, you can't possibly do that in your body. Mm -hmm. And um, actually now, thank goodness, we have access to social media, mm -hmm. which you know has its drawbacks. But one of the amazing things is that we get to see bodies of all shapes and sizes mm -hmm. do every kind of thing that a human body can do. So if you want to find a ballerina who lives in a larger body, you can. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have that access, which is quite unfortunate. Mm -hmm. yep. But I'm thrilled that, you know, my children do. So yeah. that's it. And we we just keep evolving and we keep growing and we keep changing. And I think, you know, one of the one of the changes that we're seeing culturally, and we kind of touched on this earlier, is, you know, I used the word healthy earlier. Um, and it's through however we want to define that. Mm -hmm. And that's because you teased something. You said there yeah. was um, something called healthism. Yeah. Can you talk to that? Yeah. So this is, in my opinion, like the next social justice issue that is just mm -hmm. like hidden under the table and that should be brought out from under the table and made a centerpiece, um, in addition to weight stigma. Mm -hmm. But in my opinion, healthism is what contributes to weight discrimination. Um, 
or anti-fat bias. Mm -hmm. Um, And by the way, I use the word fat as a neutral descriptor. And I think it's really important for your listeners to know that. How do you define it? Like is, or is it? Yeah. Like, Hmm. how do you know? Uh, I don't hmm, How do you know if you're fat? Interesting. Well, I, I'll go back to health as in, in a moment. Okay. Yeah, How yeah. do you know if you're fat? Great question. No one has ever asked me that. Listen, I think this is self-defined. It is countercultural to call yourself fat because right now, unfortunately, fat is seen as something negative. But here's the deal. I am fat. I can stand up and show you my body. Um, I Beautiful, um, beautiful. <laughs> um, I weigh 215 pounds and I'm five foot three. I love you. Thank you for being so bold. Give us all permission to be like, here we are. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Well, quick round of applause. Yeah. Um, well, this is my line of work. Right. Um, and so I, um, guess what? I weigh that much, that much. Um, but, uh, nothing is physically wrong with me. You're, you're by standards, healthy. I'm healthy. I really don't like the word healthy. We're using quotes though, right? Like me. Okay. So let me tell you what I like when I feel healthy, I feel hydrated. My gut feels balanced and I'm, I have regular bowel movements and I sleep well and I'm not overeating. And if I do, I'm choosing it. Um, I feel healthy when I can get up out of the chair. I feel right. Like to me, that's healthy. That's, Mm -hmm. that's what I look at healthy. Mm -hmm. Um, Does that resonate? Does that line up? It, It does. I think that what happens is that in diet culture, diet culture sends us the message that there's one way to be healthy. And that way is right. through a thin body. And which is not true, right? Like, well, like, it's not it, true. It, it, it can be true. It can be true for some people, I guess, right? But that is only one measure, one metric of well, it's no measure. Right. Michaela, it's no measure. The size and shape of your body has absolutely nothing to do with your health. BMI has been debunked. Hmm. We have Hmm. study after study after study, so many that have shown us that weight does not automatically make you unhealthy. Okay. So what does? Yeah. So what does? Well, I think that is in the eye of the beholder. Mm -hmm. Nobody can tell me Mm -hmm. what healthy is. Nobody can tell you what healthy is. Healthism is the idea that we place value on certain types of, uh, on on conditions, on health conditions, on- Perceived metrics. Exactly. So we say to ourselves, aha, so somebody who has paralysis Mm -hmm. um, is not as, is maybe in the worst health than somebody who, you know, has type two diabetes. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, but the problem with that is that in diet culture, and I'm going to defi- define diet culture soon. We have to get there. But in diet culture, what happens is that um, we place an enormous, in fact, almost all of the emphasis on health, on the physical experience sacrificing the mental emotional experience so With what is if- right back to what you said earlier about it's not the weight that makes us sick it's more about the mental the the, the what we're thinking and what we're doing mm-hmm. and can we talk about the stigma not only around weight but then around mental health right yes. and how we stigmatize i am not happy i want help and people what's wrong with you right and mm-hmm. now we now we're double stigmaing a person yeah. who's already struggling. Right. I mean, if you are a chronic dieter, let's say, and you spend an enormous amount of time, energy, money, resources on trying to eat just the right amount of food and exercise the, mental the right way. Wherewithal yeah. that takes. Oof. Yeah. Okay. 
is that, you know, healthy compared to somebody who has lost their feeling in their legs? Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not sure. This is in the eye of the the beholder. The Mm -hmm. problem is when society says, oh, but you're thin. So who cares what you're doing in order to get to the place where you are? Mm -hmm. Because you're maintaining a thin body and a thin ideal is the most important. As a matter Mm -hmm. of fact, if you are thin and paralyzed, doesn't really matter because you're still thin. Wow. So I would say that- Yeah. So I would say that it's the pursuit of the thin body that has caused really all of this Mm. and that the thin body and, and that there is something called thin privilege, Mm -hmm. just like there is white privilege, Mm -hmm. Tell me just like there's socioeconomic privilege and housing privilege and right. Um, And so we don't talk about that though. Right. Right. The world thinks that you are better, Michaela, because you live in a thinner body than I am. What? How could that you be? You know, and <laughs> and I total honesty and vulnerability. So I weigh, I don't even know, like 152 pounds. Um five foot seven and three quarters. <laughs> Thought I was five foot eight, but I'm not. Um And I used to, I love the language. Thank you for sharing that live in a body, right? Like I am just energy in a body is my, my belief. And this body is merely here to move me forward. And about five or six years ago, I lived in a body that was 185 pounds and I felt fat, Mm -hmm. right? Because I wasn't getting up out of the chair, feeling good. I wasn't sleeping well. I didn't feel good, right? My body didn't look anything. I just felt gross inside. Yes, there was the perception outwardly. I'd had babies, you know, all the things. But I also had a daughter. I have a daughter and I have a son who I want to trust their bodies and to honor their bodies. And I began shifting my mindset of why do I eat this food? I began changing my relationship with food and becoming more intuitive with it but I was able to change the body. Now I'm in the 152 pound body and I feel really great, but I work really hard for it. I exercise and I'm not saying other people don't, but I have chosen to put this body and its strength and how it feels when it wakes up in the morning as a top priority, because that to me is my healthiest me that I've come to know. Um, And it gives me the energy and the fuel and all the things to do what I believe I'm here to do, which is work like sharing your story. But I can tell you that I have seen, I can recognize my own privilege that I've lived in this body. I'm a white woman, blue eyes, blonde hair, Uh right? Cisgender. I am very normal, very typical, but I have definitely seen my own privilege and it doesn't feel good. It, even on the receiving end of being positively received in this smaller body, it doesn't feel good. I get, oh, look how skinny you are. And, oh, you're just the pretty one. And and I'm like, I'm here. I'm a whole entity in this body. And all I am seen for often is the smaller whatever people perceive. And it doesn't feel good. Give some great things that you can say to people who, who say that to you. Please. Comment on the size and shape of your body. Please. One of the things you can say is, oh, you know, I'm also smart and I'm uh, very emotionally aware. Mm -hmm. Um, And while I appreciate your comment on my looks, Mm -hmm. actually, it's more meaningful meaningful to me if you could comment on my character. Mm, I like it. (laughs) <laughs> I like it. Well, you and this is say good it. because one of the things I have been saying to people is thank you for your observation, but mm-hmm. I feel healthy and I'm very happy, right? Like that's what matters to me. Not what this body looks like um, is what it can do for me is how, is how I've really, really steered myself. And again, back to my kids, I want my daughter to not try to be skinny. I want her to be strong and and capable and confident in her body. So 
I think that's a nice little draw into okay. one of the things that really attracted me most about you when I met you at our big conference, our women's empowerment conference in May was you're wearing this vibrant dress with this super fun, super fun jewelry. I think you just, every time I see you wear fun jewelry mm-hmm. and, <laughs> um, but we started talking and I found out what you do. And I shared a little bit with you about my daughter who mm-hmm. is incredible and amazing and super intuitive, but commonly known as a very particular picky eater. Mm-hmm. And so we started talking about this because she is intuitive and I don't know much about intuitive eating mm-hmm. um, nor, I mean, I think I know for myself, but I don't know how to nurture it in someone else. I don't know what her intuitions are. Mm-hmm. So could you, for me and our listeners, define what intuitive eating is Absolutely. and then tell me a little bit about, um, for me, the woman, the individual, and then perhaps for my kids, because I, I want to do this with my son as well, but he's mm-hmm. a little more flexible. Absolutely. So intuitive eating, first, a little background on intuitive eating. It was created by two nutritionists about 30, 40 years ago and mm-hmm. only gained popularity in the last about decade. Mm-hmm. You can get your hands on the book they wrote, which is intuitive eating, the fourth edition. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm a certified- the fourth edition is important, right? Fourth edition That's- is important. Okay. I'm a certified intuitive eating counselor, which means that I completed a training with the founders of the um, movement. Super cool. Um, And there are over a hundred studies now that actually uh, support the idea of intuitive eating. I am going to read you the definition of intuitive eating from From the book, (laughs) one of my Bibles. And this is the intuitive eating workbook. It It is a great way for you to dive into intuitive eating. Mm -hmm. Although I will say not easy to do by yourself because a lot of it is nuanced and does require support and a community. Okay. So intuitive eating, I'm reading right from the workbook, is a dynamic mind-body integration of instinct, emotion, and rational thought. Intuitive eating is a personal process of honoring your health by paying attention to the messages of your body and meeting your physical and emotional needs. Mm. It is an inner journey of discovery that puts you front and center. You are the expert of your own body. Only you know your feelings, your thoughts, your experiences. Only you know how hungry you are or what food will feel satisfying to you. No diet plan knows what your body needs. Intuitive eating is tapping into... Hold on. Let's (laughs) stop and clap for that. That's fantastic. Okay, carry on. Thank you. That was really good. Great. So intuitive eating is the anti-diet approach to eating. It is, uh, in essence, it's honoring your hunger and fullness cues and fighting satisfaction in food. Now, intuitive eating gets a bad rap for being the hunger and fullness diet. It couldn't be more opposite. Meaning you're either hungry or you're really full? Is that? Well, it's just that you eat food until you become full and you only eat food when you're hungry. Now, this is not the human condition because food serves so many other purposes Mm -hmm. and emotional eating in my mind is a completely acceptable way of eating. It's also kind of jargony and I, I can talk about that. I mean, isn't all eating emotional? Hmm. I mean, it should be, right? Like you should be att- like connected to what you're doing, but we aren't always, a lot of times we're just shoveling food in. Right. 
But eating also is like a central part of so many cultural ex and societal experiences, yeah, celebration, mm -hmm. family, community, right? I mean, and then there are all these connotations about food that make it seem like a negative thing mm -hmm. to focus on and to eat. Mm -hmm. um, but actually, I believe that when you call yourself an emotional eater, it is a gift because an emotional eater is one who understands their emotion when they are eating. Hmm. So it could be that <clears throat> they just had a really hard day at work and they haven't eaten in like six or seven or eight hours since lunch. You know, that very often mm -hmm. happens to many parents in, in particular. I work with a lot of parents mm -hmm. and, um, it does feel like it can feel like emotional eating at seven or eight o'clock when you're really, really hungry. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, and also what it does is it gives you the opportunity to figure out, wait, what is really going on here? What do I need? What emotional need is Great this girl. food trying to fulfill? Mm -hmm. Now, in the beginning of intuitive eating, it is very natural and expected to eat in a way that is what we talk about as out of control or not feeling um, like you are um, trusting your body. Intuitive eating is the exact opposite. Intuitive eating is about trusting your body's instincts the embodiment right being in, embodiment. in the body and and fully aware and you know I talk a lot with people about a full body yes um I work with a lot of leaders and if you're going to do something do you have the full body yes and people sometimes have a hard time checking in and how do we get into our bodies to know mentally physically spiritually that we are in alignment moving forward with whatever the choice may be um, you know, and I, I can help people get there, but how do you help people quiet the noise? Right. And, and thank you for sharing all of this, because this is so in line with my coaching practice. It's like, hold mm -hmm. up, pause. What are you doing? Why? What do you think is going to happen? Are you willing to risk that? And, yeah. or, or willing to bet on that. And, um, so I think it's so important that we really, really offer any gifts we can to the, to our listeners of how do I, there's so much happening in my body. How do I listen for what feels intuitive? How do we get to that place? Yeah. So I think establishing a foundation of self-compassion is really mm -hmm. critical. That just feels good to hear. <laughs> <laughs> Let's be a little more compassionate with ourselves. Um, yeah. How do you, how do you get people to see that right in this world right. of, of judgment and stigma and, and, and belonging or, or not belonging? Yeah. Thank you for doing your work also, Michaela. This is this is where it's at. Um, it's well, <laughs> well, I think, first of all, I follow Kristen Neff's work. I don't know if you know Kristen Neff. Love her work, her research on, she really has. Sounds familiar. Popularized, she's popularized self-compassion, done a lot of research on it. She's like a pioneer in self-compassion. And she... <clears throat> brings the idea that self-compassion is really about talking to ourselves the way we might talk to a friend mm. or a child. Mm -hmm. And why is it that women in particular, I'll talk about the women, you know, the woman's experience, the woman's condition, yeah. uh, because I am one. Why is it that women are so critical of themselves all the time? And instead of going to a place of self-kindness, of understanding that we are living in a common humanity and that we don't need to criticize ourselves in order to exist, why is it that we can't go to the place of self-kindness? Mm -hmm. And I will argue that one of the reasons is the patriarchy and diet culture. Yeah, and that's, you know, I have to say, I don't think you're wrong, you know, and, and capitalism that, that is very much associated with the patriarchy, not all their fault. And 
I love the men. They're out there are beautiful, wonderful. This is not about individuals, yeah. right? But, but the, the system it's that system. has created the yes. conditions within which we live. And, you know, when, when we look at how this happens over time, <clears throat> you mentioned earlier that the culture was changing in the seventies. It was just a few days ago, 50 year anniversary that women were allowed to get a credit card without their husband there, right? Like, or a male signing off. And when we think about choices and what we can do and how dependent, truly, truly dependent women culturally in our society have been on men, it's very easy to see why it's, oh, we have to be the ones showing up because that's our asset, right? It not, not true today, not true in my world, but true in the story of our culture. Um, so when we look at getting into our bodies, especially for women, getting into our body meant being beautiful and being perfect and desirable so that the men would want us and then keep us, right? So things have changed and we now have this opportunity to help women get into their bodies. Um, and I think it is especially more difficult for women to do that, but maybe I'm being very gender general. Um, how would you say when you think <clears throat> about are our kids. How do you help kids understand embodiment, especially when their brains aren't even fully formed most of their teenage years? <laughs> yeah. Actually, kids have more access to their interoceptivity. Because their brains aren't fully formed, probably. Because their brains aren't fully formed. The ego is not fully set in. They're, That's oh. right. Okay. It's Thanks right. for unwinding that. <laughs> Children are naturally interoceptive, which is just the ability to access your inner cues. Mm -hmm. um, when a baby is born, <clears throat> that baby knows from the moment they are born how much food they eat, they need, and and when to move away from the nipple, the bottle, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Over time, this system of oppression called diet culture takes that away. Hmm. And if you have spent decades, years, months, weeks, engaging in, following in outside messages about what you should eat, and what you shouldn't eat, and how you should exercise, mm -hmm. um, then you lose touch with your interoceptivity and essentially your body trust. Now, Children, in my experience, are the easiest to get back to that. One of the ways, one of the things we talk about, I talk about with parents, I coach parents on this, is what if somebody said to you, you know what, I want you to only pee three times a day. That's it. Three times a day. If you have to pee in between, if you would just do like a second of peeing, that would be good. And no peeing after 6 p.m. <laughs> what if that was the real cultural message? Well, I will say I've done some pelvic floor physical therapy, so I have a <laughs> lot of comments on that, but we'll we'll come back to that later. Um, but that you're so right. This is when you eat. This is what you eat. This is what it should look like. Boom, boom, boom. And even as babies, even as babies, make sure they eat this much, this many times per day. And, and who's promoting that? You know, the same people who are promoting the formulas, most likely. That's right. Um, so we begin to take away that agency at that very young age. And I will say one of the real moments of awakening for me was, um, okay, back to my daughter, she's picky, right? And now grandparents and friends yeah. and neighbors and cut all the people are like, what do you mean you don't eat this? And da, 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 you need to, you need to, you need to, you need to, you need to. And I just, I had this image. I think she was six years old at the time. And I had this image of her at the age of 16 and the world going, you need to, you need to, you need to. And I said, whoa, if I don't teach her today to be okay with what she puts in her body, to be in control of that, I can't, I, I don't know that she'll have the skills when she's 16, when it's sex and drugs and right. who knows what else is coming down the pike for these kids right. um, and social media, right? So it became a real 
point of of focus for me. So now I kind of walk around like, you know, Wonder Woman in front of her, like, nope, don't ask that question. Nope. And I, not really, but I tell my family what she eats for dinner is not up for debate. That's my responsibility to make sure she has enough nourishing food. It is not your responsibility to worry that she's not eating the spaghetti squash. Yes. Not your problem. Beautiful. I mean, it is about boundaries here. Yep. Yeah. And the more focus you put on, you know, the kind of yep. eating patterns she has, in my experience, uh, the more these patterns will persist. Right. Mm, let me put it this way. It's not the focus. It's the emotionality you bring to it. Mm. Mm -hmm. Right. Because it's okay to talk about the thing, but am I catastrophizing it? That's right. Or am I, and I don't want to normalize her picking. I want her to eat diverse foods just because it gets boring packing the same stuff for lunch every day. But that's my want for her. She's happy. Doctor says she's healthy. You know, she, we've got, we've got a lot figured out, but I don't want her to look at me and say, mommy lost all this weight. She's skinny a plus. I want her to look at me and mommy made all these choices that have helped her be her strongest, healthiest, happiest self. And I want her to see that she gets to say yes to what goes in her body. She gets to say yes, but she has to do it with awareness of what's best for her. Not a, I don't eat pizza, so I'll never eat pizza mindset, but I don't eat pizza because I don't like it. I don't enjoy it. And there are healthier options, you know? Um, well, I think, yeah, I mean, it, yes. And I will say that, I love yes and. Is she, and is she a sensitive soul? Very. Yes. Right. Tell me about so, it. Yeah. So even if you feel like you have come to the place. May I, may I Please. go to advice Please. giving? Right now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. Okay. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. I, I brought you here for your expertise and your insights. Please share. <laughs> right. Because thank you for asking my consent. A, a good coach gets consent. Mm -hmm. Um. So even if you have said to her, you know, I feel fantastic in my body. This mm -hmm. is what my body needs. This is how I like being in my body. Yeah. Um, there is this messaging from the world mm -hmm. that a thin body is the most important body. Mm -hmm. So regardless of what you say, she's right. hearing it outside. And it could be, I, how old is she? She is 10. Okay. So it could be that even though your messaging mm -hmm. is good, she's still hearing it from other people. It could be a it could be other generations. It could be friends. Mm -hmm. Now, the thing is, is that I believe it's really hard to suss out the difference between control and structure mm. when it Anymore. comes to yeah. when it comes to feeding children. Okay. And this is what I work with parents on a lot. So control would be bringing emotionality into the feeding process. Control would be, I want you to eat that. You need to eat that. Because if I said so. Isn't that enough? I said so. If you don't have your carrots, you can't have dessert. Mm -hmm. um, stop fighting with your brother. If you don't stop fighting with them, I'm not going to give you candy after dinner. Yeah. Um, just take one bite. All you need to take is one bite. Here, we can put it on the tip of the, we can even wrap it in a wrap. We can put some chocolate on the spoon as well. Just mm -hmm. one bite. The sensitive soul, the sensitive child uh, who hears that could be internalizing the idea that there are some foods that are good mm -hmm. and there are some foods that are bad. And mm -hmm. that is diet culture. Mm -hmm. So what you want to do, what any parent, in my opinion, wants to do is become an authoritative parent, an authoritative okay. parent. Have you heard of authoritative parenting? I mean, I, I can logically leap, but I'm, I'm yeah. very, especially in contrast to the controlling parent, I yeah. think this is going to be a nice. Yeah. So an authoritative parent is a parent who provides um, standards high standards and high support. Okay. Now, not too high, <laughs> but our research shows that parents who don't provide 
an expectation or who don't set the expectation and say, okay, these are the chores you need to do. This is the way you need to, you, you need to hand in your homework assignments on time. You need to treat your friends like this. You need to be outside. The parents who don't set these standards um, see a lot of behavior that is just not fun. We'll put it well, like that. Kids and adults alike, we like expectations. We like to be able to meet the expectation. And if the expectation is unclear, right, it's hard to feel good and satisfied. So we act out. I can totally see how that links. Yeah. And then it's support. So if you provide a nurturing environment, if you provide a way to talk about emotions, talk about the experience mm. of having to live within the standards you've set and to be a supportive entity, then like you've got a great combination there. I and like the that. same thing, and the same thing works with food. Hmm. So what you want to do is not control. What you want to do is create a structure. And a structure is very different than control. A structure says to the child, these are the times we eat. This is when mealtime is. This is when snack time is. These are the foods that are available for mealtime mm -hmm. and snack time. Now there's nuance there. We could talk sure. about that. And I can unpack that with you. It's the child's think, role. Yeah, but just as the idea of this is what our family, because what you're saying is we still want to get, I don't know, four vegetables, three fruits, you know, do whatever feels right for our body, whatever the rule expectations are. But you can do it in different ways, like you can make choices about it, but snack time is snack time, meal time is meal time. This is the boundary, right? Anything you want to do there within, go right ahead. And right. because again, what, what we really want to do as, as parents, caretakers, leaders is, is teach our people to go out into the world and make good decisions on their own, right? Yeah. Because that's what I look at. I can dictate what my kids are going to eat. I mean, I can try. I might get a lot of resistance, right? But if I, and I think this is where you're going, but not too much earlier, keeping the balance and authority versus not dominating, controlling. Um, I want my kids, I want my daughter to go out into the world at 6, 16, and 26 and know how to make decisions that are right for her, right? To isolate, to quiet the noise and say, do I want to eat that? Do I want to smoke that? Do I want to have sex with that? You know, like all these are the choices I want my kids to be able to make. And if I don't give them the authority, I think this is an important part of the authority piece. If I don't give them the agency to choose, all right, it's snack time. I can have one fruit and one, you know, crappy snack, whatever the thing might be. I judged, sorry, nutritionally, not high value. I, I don't know. If, I don't know if crappy food is a bad thing to say or not, but you know, it's all about choices. And if I take away their agency as they're living under my little wings, how are they going to have big wings of their own when they need to figure it out? Mm -hmm. And I think where, where you and I so much align is no matter if it's how we work, how we eat, how we sleep, how we fight, if we don't slow down and take that pause and go, hold on, what am I doing and why? Why? Am I trying this diet and this diet and this diet and this diet because I want to look like the people on the in the magazines or whatever? Or do I want to learn to love what is and get closer to the intuition? You know, if there's a problem with your foot, you're going to go to the doctor and figure it out. You're going to see specialists. You're going to watch TikTok videos like I did and find the fun inserts that are going to change your life. And Mm -hmm. We have to be curious because the way we're doing things is not working. And that is my judgment based on a lot of years of working with people um, and studying statistics and reports on all of this. And we're, we're not okay. However, we want to define healthy. We are over medicated. We are, people are choosing suicide at insane levels. And I say that with a heavy heart um, and, and we're not okay. We're not okay. We're in debt. What are we doing? Right. 
So when we kind of tie all of this together, if we could take away the stigmas that create the separation, the othering of each other, whether it's our cultural, political, religious, or our food choices, um, you know, and I've, I've interviewed people for the show that are of Indian descent and Asian descent, and they mm. talk about even the smell of their food and how that created the othering for them, for their children. And so I go back to it. Let's take that magic wand. Let's get rid of the stigma. Let's clean up all of that and really celebrate the divine that's within you living in that body through all of the bumps and hurdles and obstacles and stigmas you've had to really leap over to stand here and say, I love this body. I'm putting my words in. I love this body and I'm willing to use it for its greatest good, which is helping other people love their bodies and, and feel embodied and to feel joy in that. And I can't think of anything else because we can't do the work that I want to do with people if, if they're sick all the time or if, you know, they're checked out or however it goes. I want people who are willing to transform mm -hmm. and to grow. So what would you say is the, the secret sauce for you? What is your divine gift? Because I just said a lot of words that I think about your divine gift. But where would you point to as being your divine gift and, and what you're living out today? Hmm. I think it is my ability to see my thoughts as unproductive at times and as limiting and as unintentional and my ability to reframe those thoughts into intentional thoughts hmm. and in doing so people around me see that that's possible and hopefully do it too hmm. That is why, thank you for that. That is why I created this podcast. I want people to see what the potential. I The work I do is all about human potential. And when we can see <clears throat> someone breaking the norms, right? When we think of like a health and eating coach, right? We're, we're typically thinking of, you know, the little yogis that run around and, right? And, and there's an idea. But when we can see you, fully living out this desire. And I say that with ultimate gratitude. It goes, what can I do that I didn't think I could do? Right? With my body, with whatever it is that I might have, what can I do that I previously had a self-limiting belief for? Right? So, you know, I have like funky teeth. Maybe I should go be a tooth model, like a smile <laughs> model and like break the mold on what like a normal <laughs> smile looks like. And I mean, they're not that bad, but you know, like why not? Why do our smiles all have to look perfect and neatly invisaligned? I mean, mm -hmm. it's lovely, but, but I think the idea here is I want people to see what's possible. And when we think about our children, someone listening to this had no idea that this was an important conversation to have with their kids because they are doing exactly what the commercials tell them to do. They are feeding exactly at this time. They're getting one, two, three, four, five, and they're winning the gold star for parenting. Or maybe they're not, right? And to know that there's this this type of conversation, oh, it's it's liberating, right? When I stopped arguing about the pizza with my daughter, I'm like, well, this is just great. Now okay. I just get to enjoy her, and we're not, you know, bantering about how you tried it once when you were two and you loved it. You know, be done with it. Yes, and and that we call food neutrality. Mm hmm. Mm. Food the idea. Is fuel, right? Like that's it. Like it's well, just no. no, I don't I don't necessarily agree with that because food is I, also really fun. Food is fun. Food is yeah. eaten when life is hard. Mm -hmm. Food can be a really important salve, mm -hmm. a really important soothing mechanism. I call that ice cream. And <laughs> what's important is that you recognize that you are using food to soothe mm -hmm. and to see and ask yourself, is this really soothing me? Thank you. Right mm -hmm. there. That is so important. And we're just going to highlight underscore all of this. We do things all the time, right? We're going to eat the bonbons. We're going to eat the ice cream. 
and we think it's going to fix something, but we have to look at before, during, and after. What did you go into it expecting, right? Did you expect to get soothed? Did you give yourself space for that? Were you eating it going, this is so soothing, thank you so much? Or was it just shoveling in the Ben and Jerry's, right? Are you getting out of it what you wanted? And that's the intuitive part, the, the intentional part, right? Yes. <clears throat> and keep digging. I will, I will, I will dig even further, dig which is that intuitive eating is the process in which you discover your hunger and fullness cues. Now, if you have been dieting or restricting food, restriction, food restriction is a hallmark of dieting, mm -hmm. right? Labeling foods as good and bad, mm -hmm. um, right? And or crappy like I did earlier. <laughs> That, yeah, that it's it's fine. I mean, this is this is the way we are. This is our culture. This is this is why I'm doing this because I want to learn the stronger yeah. language to talk about the food police. Right, having the food police, you know, maintaining this diet mentality of again, my goal is thinness, mm -hmm. and so I categorize foods in one group or the other. A child who does that internalizes when they eat the bad food. Uh oh, I'm bad. I'm bad. But a key part of intuitive eating, which is, in my opinion, very difficult, and especially to di difficult to do on your own, um, which is why there are certified intuitive eating counselors like myself. A key part is the ability to give yourself permission to eat whatever you want. Mm. That when is you so give counterintuitive to everything we've been taught. Exactly. When you give yourself permission to eat whatever you want is when you find discernment. Mm. Permission plus abundance equals discernment. Mm. Permission, I give myself permission to eat. There's 500 cookies. Do I wanna eat all 500? Only I can answer that, right? But I, I may <laughs> want, you know, Part of me is wondering, and please keep digging, but but I'm only really going to enjoy the first five cookies. Do I stop there? But I really want the 500, but I know my satisfaction of the other 495 won't be nearly as key. So like, how do we, where do, where it do, out. Where do I go? Right. So I guess the answer would be, what is your goal? Hmm. If your goal I want is to enjoy to cookies. I love cookies. Yeah. So if your joy is to, if your goal is to be able to enjoy and find satisfaction in food, then you really do have to give yourself permission to eat whatever you want. Now, that is a very scary proposition. Yeah, because there's and that is cookies. <laughs> right. And that is what people resist. Mm -hmm. I have done this. I promise you. That once you've given yourself permission to eat all the cookies you've ever wanted, they no longer take oh. that importance, take, make that, make them, you know, this thing that you must have. They're no longer the forbidden fruit. There, there's just 500 cookies and they might be there forever. So be it. So for me, I would say, what is my goal? Well, I want to eat the cookies. But I would also say knowing this version of myself and the one in an hour that still wants to get up and go, 500 cookies is not going to make me want to get up and go get my kids and live my life. So I can see taking away the forbidden fruit. I could eat them all if I wanted to, but do I want to? And I think that want part is you can eat anything you want. It doesn't mean anything that's available to you. It doesn't mean anything that you're told to, but what I want, and I want five of those cookies and I'm going to take five more and I'm going to put them in my bag and I'm going to save them for later because that sounds like it would feel good, right? Is that where it is? Like if we have the abundance, mm. we can have it all. Therefore it takes away that, oh my God, the um, scarcity, right? It takes scarcity away the scarcity mindset where it's like, if I don't eat them all right now, somebody else is going to come and eat them and I'll never get to enjoy them. Right. I suppose, um, I'm not sure, we'd have to dive in a little bit more, yeah, yeah. but people who really want to become intuitive eaters and want to 
find satisfaction in food need to go through what is called the habituation process. This is like a step in the intuitive eating approach to food. And the habituation process is really about giving yourself whatever you want to eat whenever you want it. Hmm. And if you do that over time and with the support from a professional, eventually all foods become neutral. Hmm. Right. Because you, you can have it all and you can you have, have it whenever you want. And, and if you want I can also, it. Hmm. I can also pretty much guarantee if you were told, all right, you know what, Michaela, I want you to just eat cookies hmm. for the next 48 hours, only cookies. I'd get pretty bored. It's it'd be like working in a donut shop and never wanting to eat donuts again or something. Okay. After that 48 hours, I don't know if you'd make it to the 48 hours, <laughs> but after the 48 hours, you, you would not want another cookie Yeah, for a long time. <laughs> You are correct. So it, it's your body's, it's, your body has to be trained, has to understand, your body has to understand that it can get whatever it wants mm -hmm. in order for you to be able to tap into your natural cues. Mm, that is so interesting. <laughs> Aren't our, our brains just so powerful? Ah, it's all so about the brain powerful and when we use it with authenticity with with intuition with clarity my goodness I mean we really are unstoppable mm -hmm. um so I I don't want to leave this conversation we're back to school we've just gone through summer and if we can before we end I would like to ask you um when do I know mm -mm, what am I looking for to identify unhealthy, uh, <laughs> disadvantageous or troublesome um, habits or behaviors with my son or daughter, you know, like what are okay. some of the signs? That's where we're going. Okay. Yes. So thank you for letting me muddle mm -hmm. through the language. It's again, I have to unculture myself to think yes. good and bad in food. So yeah. And I have a book recommendation, by the way, in order for you to understand all of this, which is anti-diet. The book is called Anti-Diet mm -hmm. by Christy Harrison, okay. one of the pioneers in the movement. She wrote the book about four or five years ago. Thank you. She also has a podcast called Food Psych that I highly recommend. Very popular. Excellent. All right. So what is important for parents is to know the distinction between disordered eating and eating that is not disordered. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. So disordered. And, and again, not again, but you are not an eating disorder specialist, right? So we're just going to put that out. So this is all coming through the lens of intuitive eating, right? Just right. To clear that up because if if people do have eating disorders, that that's a conversation for two other women, I think, right? Yeah. Right there. <laughs> Yeah, I just I mean, want to throw the disclaimer in because it's important that people know what they're hearing yes. and how to apply it. So, right. There are a few eating disorders and they are mental illnesses mm -hmm. and they require treatment and they're serious eating mm -hmm. disorders. They must be taken very seriously. Mm -hmm. Eating disorders are on the rise and unfortunately impact children earlier and earlier every year. Mm -hmm. Disordered eating is not in the DSM for it's not a mental illness. Disordered eating is becoming distracted with food in order to achieve a certain body type. Hmm. It is uh, not listening to your body in pursuit, again, of this certain body type. And are we, are we leaning towards thin body type or does it go both? Right. Okay. It doesn't go both ways. I Nobody wants to so, eat that. But, no, but it's, you know, just to, just to clarify, right. Because it's, it, let's be, let's be sure on what we're looking at. And I don't know. Okay. Carry on. Carry on. I was Nobody wants to be fat. It's right, the right. avoidance. It's the avoidance of fat. Hmm. Okay. It's the 
what would eat disordered eating look like? Yeah. So it's the child who repeatedly, again, this is nuanced and again, requires but like a very generally process, mm-hmm. but it's the child who um, decides they don't want to eat dinner. Hmm. And the reason they don't want to eat dinner is because they've had a lot of snacks. They tell you they've had a lot of snacks. Maybe you've seen it. Maybe you haven't. And they tell you that they're just, they may even say I'm full. Hmm. And day after day after day, they don't show up to dinner. Then you start to see that at 10, 11 o'clock at night, they are again looking for food. And maybe this child is taking, hiding food in their room or eating when, you know, your right. parent is not around. So these kinds of behaviors that um, are out of the ordinary mm-hmm. are behaviors to observe. They are behaviors to notice. They are not the first thing that you must avoid is your emotional response. I know the immediate re- emotional response is, oh my God, can I curse? Yeah. Is cursing okay? Like, holy Absolutely. shit, what the hell is going on here? Right. And like, eat panic, this. Panic, food. panic, Yeah. Yep. You must come to dinner. It's not an option. This is when dinner is. All right. That is the very thing the child wants to hear. Mm. Because you are saying to the child, I'm going to give you attention mm-hmm. for the very behavior that I don't like. Yeah. Mm. And that is such a, there's so much to unpack there about parenting in general, positive discipline versus punitive discipline. Um, But it's, we want connection. We are, Brene Brown says it, right? We are Mm -hmm. hardwired for connection. And if I'm not getting the attention and and whatever love feelings that I need, I'm going to seek it out some other way. And when the world is telling me I'm supposed to look like this and I can hide this over here and let's just pack it all in and shh, and then I'm going to explode. Um, and I think our kids do that at, at the age of three and 13. I mean, and you know, I'm 44 and I still kind of do it sometimes, right? Like we, yeah, yeah. our human instinct is we want to belong. If we fear that disconnection, we're going to overcompensate or we're just going to embrace failure, nothingness. Well, if I'm not going to win, I'm not even going to try. Um, so having that conversation with the kids of, Oh, okay. Tell me more versus like, oh shit, the world's on fire. Let's, let's deescalate a little bit, right? Like let's not, let's not add fuel to the fire. Um, what would one other indicator of disordered eating be in your Um, experience? Yeah. A child who starts to lose weight or gain weight. A child who, and again, nuanced, it's not only the case that when children gain or lose weight, Mm -hmm. doesn't always mean that there's a disorder issue. Right. A child who stops exercising or starts exercising in a way that they haven't previously. Got it. Um, A child who has stopped wearing tight fitting clothing. Mm. A child who who has started wearing tight fitting clothing, a and child- some of these, like you said, are very nuanced, right? Yeah. Like, like my son um, a couple months ago, I was like, "Ooh, is he getting, you know, putting on a little weight there?" Like, you know, he's in his video games and all this, and I'm like, "That's interesting." I didn't say a word about it, but then I thought, you know what? He's also due for a growth spurt, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And he immediately pulled up and and thinned out and. I never said a word about it, but I had to like stop myself from that, that fear of him getting fat. Right. And say, okay, what else could it be? I had to get curious about it because he's more than just the one thing. So, um, that's awesome that you did that. Yeah. Our internalized anti-fat bias is loud. Oh, it is real. I get it. I get it. But so what would you say if you could put something on a billboard and thank you for all that wonderful, those tips there. Um, This is one of my favorite questions and Tim Ferriss uses it on his podcast and assuming that your interests, your business, whatever um, affiliations you represent are all properly represented in marketing. If you could put one thing on that billboard, maybe it's to help you establish your magic wand 
Mm. What would you say to people today? Again, subject to change tomorrow. Mm. But you have the opportunity to touch millions mm. of people's experiences. What would you say? Great question. It would be something to the effect of what do you want? Yeah. And folks, it is that simple. That question, there's no further preamble. There's no follow-up. It's when was the last time someone asked you what you want? Not what do you want for lunch? Not what do you want? But what do you want? Yeah. And and we can't wait for the world to ask us that. We have to, we have to, friends. I don't often tell people what to do. It's not my job as a coach, you know, to tell you what to do. Um, it should be intuitive. But if we don't pause to at least create the space for the intuition to exist. And just like with meditating, you're not going to get it the first time, probably, maybe. You're not going to even get it the second. But but if we continue to just pause and give ourselves that little space and what do you want? What do you want? Not what do you need? What do you need to do? What do you need to feel? What do you want? And if you want 500 cookies, Lamar, let's eat the cookies. I don't think I'll make it past 25, but who knows, right? But it's, we have to stop living in a world where everyone else gets to tell us what is right for us. And if we do not stop and say, what do you want? Sure, ain't nobody else going to answer it for us. And if they do, it's going to be to their betterment, their benefit, and whatever else their fancy is. So with that, um, mm. whew, we packed in a lot of information. Mm -hmm. That was, that was good. Okay. So if we want to find out more about intuitive eating and working with you, and I will say friends, one thing we didn't get to talk about today was how you bring this into the business space, mm. right? It's mm -hmm. one thing people are like, ah. I get it. I buy the groceries. I make the lists. Mm. I cook the meals. But um, if you could do like a 30 second, like how do you bring this to the business world? Ah, okay. So anti-fat bias is everywhere mm -hmm. and it is her particularly loud in office environments or anywhere where there are co a collection of human beings. And, and a hierarchy that already yes. exists, right? Because I mean, all organ, most organizations should have a hard hierarchy, but okay. What do you see there? What is the, what, one of the, mm -hmm, one of the worst things that has become popular that is starting to maybe become less popular are wellness programs. Mm -hmm. um, and wellness culture is very aligned with diet culture. They're intertwined. Wellness programs typically exist in pursuit of a thin body. Hmm. So if you engage in this wellness program, you are likely going to commit to exercising a certain number of hours a week, right. um, eating a certain number of fruits and vegetables, and maybe even weighing yourself. That's mm -hmm. a pretty common wellness program. Don't participate. <laughs> I'm Don't. sitting here thinking of the wellness program I created at um, my previous business and I'm going through, uh oh, uh oh, what did I do? And I'm like, wait a minute, you know what? I'm actually kind of pleased. And I think I'm pleased, but like we did a steps challenge, but it was all benchmarked on their improvement, not on who walked the most, hmm. but how it was their personal growth, right? So it wasn't you versus me, but I'm going to walk this much this month or this week and try to improve. I mean, and we're in manufacturing, so we wanted our, you know, our people to be able to move about the, room comfy and we wanted them walking and we wanted them getting but I can see what you mean right because you know all right everyone's going to go walk at lunch and if you don't go what's wrong with you and oh all in all and I will say this I'm not going to judge myself for doing these things but all in well intended very yes. well intended oh very, you know, very statistically backed if your people have more wellness there's less sickness therefore you know more productivity at work and okay well that all sounds great let's do it so this is an interesting perspective yeah but the way in which wellness is defined is um very narrow it is defined That's by um not really looking at your spiritual system. health, your psychological health, your social health, your intellectual health. These are qualities that contribute in my mind much more 
mm-hmm. than the size and shape and the, of your body. And the number of steps that you're taking. And, and I will go back to it. You said it's the adverse effects come more from the mind than they do from the measure of the scale or the BMI or whatever metric we are using. Um, so I think it's something for us to consider, you know, for all the business folks out there, how does this factor in not only to your family, but um, to your work organizations and the teams that you lead? How are we making decisions, right? And and are we giving people agency to make their own decisions and determinations of what self-worth is and, um, and to do that with self-compassion? So, whew. This was awesome. We're going to close today by, um, in your bio, I read in the intro that Limor Elman is an inspiring (laughs) certified intuitive eating counselor. I'd like you to close this out today by telling us what inspiring. Uh, It is a combination of, I made this word up and my 17 year old actually made fun of me. It's a combination of inspiring and empowering. Mm -hmm. Um, why is it important that they go together? Because I have my own idea, um, yeah. but I'd really love to hear what you have to say. Listen, I, I work primarily with parents and the number one parenting tool is modeling. Mm-hmm. So if you're going to model, you're going to be inspiring, mm-hmm. but if you don't feel empowered in order to model, and it's not going to happen. And that comes through what you were talking about, self-kindness, self-compassion. Mm. I think I think it's fantastic. We talk a lot about these single words like gratitude and, you know, just be grateful and, ooh, find your empowerment. Um, empowerment is one thing, but being inspired to do the thing, right? Like, so it, 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 it's that cyclical nature of inspire me and give me the tools, the the, the mm. belief to do the thing. And then it's going to inspire more and more people and more, and it just goes on and on and on. So I wanted to close with that because I think you're right. And in this conversation, you've given us a lot of inspiration of why is this so important and the empowerment, the tools, the space, the resources to bring it to life. So if people want to find more about intuitive eating, tell us um, the very best way to, to just take more of these gems. Yeah. So I I highly recommend, like I said, uh, the intuitive eating book, fourth edition, the intuitive eating workbook. These were both written by Evelyn Triboli and Elise Rash, the founders, the creators of the movement. Also recommend Christy Harrison's book, Mm -hmm. Anti-Diet, and her podcast, Food Psych. And I'll link these in the show notes. Wonderful. And my website is family-food-freedom.com. I blog, I video blog, you'll be able to access a whole lot of information there, including an assessment to see um, whether or not you're on the path of parenting intuitive eaters or not. I love it. Well, Limor, thank you so much for the the willingness to show up in this world, um, for all the ways that you choose to show up, despite the way the world has tried to not see you. And I I just love the audacity that you bring to showing up. Um, And I say that with the greatest admiration, and I hope you continue to wear fun colors and fun jewelry and paint (laughs) your walls different fun colors. But more than that, I hope you continue to inspire people and empower them to make choices and to do it uh, intuitively in a way that makes us feel better about this little life we have. So this big little life. All right. So thank you so much. As with all things, my friends, I hope wherever you're off to, I hope you make it a great day. And thanks so much to you, Limor. Thank you, Michaela. Wonderful experience. I really enjoyed it. Really, really chock full. So thank you so much. And we'll catch you next time. And that's a wrap on another episode of And All The Things. If you enjoyed today's show, please like and follow on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube. If you really liked it, please go ahead and rate it. 
Then think about who in your life might also need to hear it and any of the other episodes we have shared. Then share it with them. When you find something meaningful, something valuable, you've got to share it and pay it forward to those you care for. Thanks for joining us and follow along on Instagram at myjoycoach to see more of me, your host, Michaela Bertieshaw. And as always, make it a great day.